for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jen Ellis, and along with Benny Allen, um, I'm the co-founder of Aura. We launched this virtual platform community, oh, cute cat, <laughs> in June 2020. And our aim is to combine art, architecture, music, and more to instill a sense of calm, well-being, and quite chiefly, discovery. Uh, so a question is, how do we do this? Uh, on the one hand, we have our virtual space with rotating exhibitions. We currently have our third exhibition up that is exploring in an expansive uh, sense, the idea of bodies. Um, and we also have very, very crucially, this uh, weekly virtual gathering program, which we entitle Exchange. So the idea is to invite artists um, who are exhibiting uh, in our in this evening or this day, depending on where you are in the world, um, we have Adeline de Monsigny, um, along with other thinkers, creators, curators, you name it, in order to have an interesting and hopefully engaging uh, conversation. Um, so today uh, we are thinking about functionality and what role that plays in contemporary art. Now, I've already had <laughs> from four different people, people messaging me being like, what do you mean by functionality? Does this count as functionality in contemporary art? But isn't that more design? I'm like, great questions, save it for today. Um, this is what we're going to be tackling and questioning. Um, so as a bit of a like swift and you know quick introduction before they proceed to introduce themselves, um, we're joined today by um, artist um, Adeline de Monsigny, who is joining us over from Mexico, where she currently is. Um, I should mention that also Adeline is one of the finalists of our inaugural open call for sculpture. Um, so Adeline created an incredible work called Handle uh, that has been, I guess you could say, digitally commissioned or created in our war, but then will go on perhaps to exist in other forms. Um, then we have Lisa and Sophia, um, who are the founders of Hagen Honderdal, um, an incredible design studio that's based out of London that combine art and design to create installations and objects, really observing also lighting. Uh, and I thought it would be really interesting to bring them on the design side. Um, then we have Hannah Lee, um, who is an architect and also a curator, as well as um, the general director of Galleria Milan in Sao Paulo, uh, and who I've personally known for many years, but also when was like running and leading residencies at Delfina. So when I think of all this interdisciplinarity, I'm like, ah, Hannah. Um, and then we've got Dakin Hart, um, who is the senior curator over at the Noguchi Museum. Um, over in New York. And you know, when you think about this interdisciplinarity um, between art and design and just kind of avoiding pigeonholing, I mean, Noguchi is very much you know, the master. So I think without further ado, it'd be wonderful um, for each of the speakers, if they may, um, to introduce um, themselves. Um, I'll just say before we open up more to the flow of conversation, please do um, think of questions. And when you think of them, feel free to drop them into the chat um, and we'll have a time at the end to, to address them. So maybe perhaps um, Adeline, you could first introduce yourself, please. Absolutely, so I'm Adeline de Monsigny. I'm currently in Mexico City. And for the last 10 years, I think my practice has been more sculptural, installation-based, um, very much to do with uh, the idea of the human body, the investigation of life within inanimate objects, so such as anthropomorphy or, or the notion of the uncanny. Um, and so this, this, I'm really pleased that we're, we're, we're getting to, to chat about function, functionality today because I've lately been more and more curious about uh, the notion of interaction in my work, in my sculptures. And I've, I've been playing along with the idea of making uh, interactive sculptures and, um, and it's created really interesting debates. Uh, as, as Jen was saying earlier, people wanting to pigeonhole it as, oh, you're making design pieces now. Oh, is it, <laughs> is it still art? And I've, I found that very, very interesting because clearly I'm not the first artist to ever make interactive work. You have Ernesto Neto, 
or or just work that might have a fu suggest a function to be sat on. I mean, I think Noguchi, uh, just reading his biography, changed my life because he he really freed a huge space that enabled me to just consider my work as what it is supposed to be. I think uh, uh, contemporary art, sculpture, design share common qualities. And I think function is one of them, form is one of them. They are different things, they are what they are, but I think, I think the, the, the debate needs to be had because it is so controversial and because it creates these discussions and these tensions. And I, I find it's, it's very interesting to the point where I thought, well, if it is controversial to make sculptures for human being, human beings, what would it be like to make sculptures for say sculptures? So I started humoring the idea and, and having really interesting debates with, with my peers, uh, one of whom is here today. I think Luke Hart has just joined the, 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 the talk. Um, I've also spoken to Melanie McLean who works, who makes sculptures and use, activates them with her performers. So I've just, uh, it's just triggered so many interesting talks and I was really looking forward to today to see what, what everybody else thought of it. So that's me. Yeah, amazing. Um, I, I really love what you were, yeah, what you were saying at the start, you know, this, this pigeonholing, this making understanding of something and also what you were describing about speaking with other peers about it, just being like, what do you mm -hmm. think? What do you, what do you feel? And um, we're going to be coming back to the various images of your work that um, that you shared over the course of the conversation, because I think it's so important for people to have a visual. Um, but I was wondering whether perhaps, Hannah, you could introduce um, yourself a little bit with your multiplicitous, um, you know, career and also in thinking about contemporary art, but then architecture and then design. Um, over to you, Hannah. I always find it a bit hard to introduce myself because I always start by saying that I have, I am this blend of cultural backgrounds and disciplines. Um, I think before I start up talking about my career path, uh, maybe I just want to say a little bit of my cultural background. I'm Korean Brazilian, um, daughter of Korean immigrants, living between London and Sao Paulo, um, married to an Italian man, just to, <laughs> just to point it out like a mix of, <laughs> of cultures. Uh, this pretty much reflects also my career, um, you know, my professional path, which started in, with architecture and urbanism background, then turning to furniture design, then moving to contemporary art, a, a commercial gallery, then doing my, my MA in curating contemporary art, then starting at uh, Galeria Milan as the general director. Ah, and I forgot, of course, like the Fina Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Where I met Dan, where I used to run the residencies for the past three years. Um, so this is like more or less where I come from and pretty much how I see this functionality of, of um, contemporary art. I chosen like a series of images here from the gallery, from the last show I worked on, um, because I think this kind of link or gives a hook how I see this functionality being a bit less of the mechanical or the engineer side of things, of doing things, and more to the expansion of uh, social responsibility or duties mm. as, we put, as we want, like in, in contemporary art. So this show is a presentation of um, Jai de Resbel, who is an indigenous artist from the Amazon region of Brazil. He comes from an ethnicity called Makushi. So the whole presentation, conceptualization, the, curate, the creation of the show has have been done by him. And what he's proposing here is pretty much transmitting or sharing with us the knowledge from uh, the Makushi ethnicity through oral histories or even about beliefs or making things pretty much based on um, rituals or visions or even transmission of this knowledge that have been resisted through the years of violence, colonization, and so on. So mm. I put it here, like I, I can continue this in a more in-depth when we go to the Q&A, but I just want to create this hook, like what does it mean also for us as institutions and commercial galleries 
to introduce an artist as such in this context of, it could be in Brazil, but it could resonate to other places, to other countries, and uh, how we see it like for the society, maybe less of anthropocentric anthropo um, way, but much mm -hmm. more in this cosmological way of like cohabiting or co-living this world. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's really, really amazing. I mean, there's multiple ways then, I mean, I'm gonna be asking the different question, the difficult question of how we dis describe function, but I, you know, coming from a, a gallery background myself, um, and I'm sure that this is something that Dakin's also thinking about in the context of a museum, it's like, what are, what role are you playing? What's the narrative that you're contributing to? And the idea of social responsibility um, is a really, really interesting one. And it relates also perhaps back to what you were even describing when it came to urbanism, right? Because it's the spaces that you inhabit. How does that role um, shift and define a society? Which actually, I mean, makes me think a lot about the work that you have been do doing, um, Lisa and Sophia. Right, so maybe you could please introduce yourselves and a little bit about uh, your uh, design practices. And well, this is one of my, I, I love this project, Eden, um, over to you. Hello, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Sophia. And then here's Lisa <laughs> on the other screen. Uh, so thanks for this introduction. Lisa and I are both actually architects by background um, and we started our studio Hagen Hinderdal uh, about a year ago uh, because we wanted to focus more on installation design and placemaking within the public realm or private realm and product design. So what you see here, um, it is an art installation which is in Belgravia, which was happening last year in autumn time. It's called Eden and it's an installation that uh, creates awareness for people on the importance of a healthy natural environment on our well-being. It was on an empty square, so it was obviously first of all to generate footfall, but then people started coming and the developers decided to keep it there for good because it had such an impact on the local society around it. Um, people really appreciated, I mean, obviously there was just after the first lockdown. So everyone appreciated the outdoors and nature. <laughs> and as you can see here, the context of it is highly urban. So it was actually the perfect setting, very tiny intervention with a very big impact. And that's one of the things we're really about. And um, it has an afterlife. Yeah. <laughs> so all the installations we do come with the thought of an afterlife. And so this is just a little gift that shows how it got relocated on another um, area in the square where it lives on for good now whoever comes to London but um, we can move, move on to the next because that's another installation we did at Dubai Design Week um, you would think that's very different from the first but um, in a way the similarity there is uh, the afterlife again so Eden was made of plants that can be repurposed and live on for good and so is Nakra this installation at Dubai Design Week were 3D printed concrete elements where we worked with local suppliers in Dubai. And after the installation, they've been repurposed as outdoor furniture and planters once again, and we actually launched it as a product. So we're always combining the installation design and the art with actual product design. So every component of our installation can then move on, be repurposed, donated, etc. So that's just quick examples. And that's then an example of an actual product. That's one of our lights, Bolla, uh, again made of concrete with local manufacturers here in the UK. And it's eco-friendly concrete where we researched how to achieve an eco-friendly concrete. And the aggregate is mixed with plastic from recycling factories. Um, and it's all cast in bubble wrap from uh, packaging waste. So uh, the packaging itself is um, mycelium, which is this fungi that grows around it and is actually very sturdy for transport, for delivery. So this is the whole cycle from the installation to the product and they go hand in hand. So from Bola, we could also then create a large scale installation in public realm or within private spaces as well. And we always want to work with the two together. I love that. And I think one thing that's really incredible was actually what you just touched upon there at the end is this idea of a cycle, how it mutually influences each other and it, you know, it, 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 it keeps on turning. Um, and when you think about 
installations um, or sculpture, and then you think of furniture design, I mean, you know, there's really Isamu Noguchi, right? Um, so <laughs> Dakin, I was wondering whether you could introduce yourself um, and the very interesting work that you do. And um, yeah, grateful that everyone's prepared these, prepared these slides and thoughts for us to be prompted by. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really just here in my role as Noguchi's representative ambassador. I really think of myself that way rather than as a curator. <laughs> um, my job is just to translate him for now. He's a working language and we just got to make sure that it is accessible for today. Um, so I'm going to run really quickly um, through some of the ways that he, 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 we really think of him as a transdisciplinary uh, practitioner. He sort of floats above the disciplines and picks and chooses uh, how to combine them as he wills. Um, he hated categorization. Um, there's a wonderful quote from a, a piece uh, written about him late, late in life. Critics have always tried to pigeonhole him, the artist himself says, and the effort drives him as close to shouting as the quiet man gets. Why do critics get so upset? Art can be whatever moves people. Why does it have to be in these categories, he asks. I like what I do to be available. I don't care if anyone thinks it's art. Think of it as whatever. Um, and this, these slides come from a public presentation that I give sometimes called Art Design Whatever. <laughs> um, about Noguchi's disinterest in, he had, he had a wonderful way of thinking around and outside of the sort of idiotic di dichotomies that um, sort of determine and, and overwhelm so much of the creativity uh, in, in the 20th century. That uh, fortunately that's started to change, I think. You know, a lot of so much more fluidity and porosity between disciplines. Um, and hopefully some of that is, is due to Noguchi himself if you wanna keep moving through. So um, here is just a good example of these. On the right hand side, you're looking at models of Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion car, um, which you can see comes out of aer very early aeronautical uh, streamlining. Um, and Noguchi was, I call him, Bucky's sculptural amanuensis. So his job was to take Bucky's sort of mathematical ideas and translate them into physical form. On the left, you can see one of his earliest sculptures, which bears more than a passing uh, resemblance to uh, hood ornaments of the time and also looks like a very early spaceship, but was, is actually a portrait of his lover, Ruth Page, the choreographer and dancer in a sack dress, a wool jersey sack dress that he designed for her for a dance called Expanding Universe. And uh, he turned her into a kind of um, amorphous mass of gas, um, you know, something like a nebula. 1933, Noguchi proposed, this was intended for a block, one square block somewhere in New York City, and it's called Play Mountain, and it's his earliest uh, playground design, and in some ways still his more, most radical concept, never executed, but just imagine if you had a, a hundred foot tall mountain across the street from the Empire State Building that was a multi-use site of leisure uh, with a sledding hill and a water slide and multiple terracing and a band shell and a, a swimming pool. Uh, Noguchi also worked on things like this was a design for a musical weather vane. Um, the notion was he, he really wanted to kind of reshape the notion of home in the Midwest uh, by creating a new sort of beacon that could be at the top of every farm house, um, every barn. Uh, in the Midwest. And the idea was that it would both uh, play music as, as wind went through the gills, um, and it was also internally lit. So it has a, a light bulb uh, in the main body of what looks like a sort of shark's body. Um, so it would, it would call to home both through light and also through sound. Of course, he worked uh, for 40 years with Martha Graham. Um, this is a very first set design they did together for Frontier. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's so interesting because he, he, at many points along his career, he, he sort of refers disparagingly to his work in the theater and thinks of it as a sideline. But later on in his life admits that, that he only gradually realized that it actually was the heart and soul of the way that he thought about sculpture and what sculpture could do. And this is from a, an installation we made uh, for Pace Gallery back in 2015 called Table Not Table where we tried to combine a whole range of objects that span the spectrum from uh, commercial usable tables up to table-like things. 
that don't have any specific purpose, or as I like to think of it, has been re released from specific responsibility. That's one way to think about function or the sort of reaction against function, mm. disciplining a particular form. Um, this is a project for Knoll, um, not in production now. We reissued with Vitra uh, earlier in this century um, and we'll probably come back again called the rocking stool. Um, Noguchi was given this uh, Nigerian market stool on, on top and developed the concept into a sort of space age version of a stool with a rounded bottom. The idea of the market stool is so brilliant is for somebody who's say tending a market stall all day long, but is the fidgety sort of person, um, this allows you to keep moving because you can rock. <laughs> and Noguchi loved the idea of furniture, simplifying furniture, um, and really liked one point furniture so that your legs are two points and the piece of furniture only provides one point because he saw that as a, a sort of step along the, the way to getting rid of furniture entirely, um, which he thought we should do. Um, he spent about five years trying to design and fabricate and market the perfect ashtray. Noguchi, like everybody else in the middle of the century was a smoker. And um, he went through this process was actually documented by a design writer and an article was written for one of George Nelson's startup design magazines, but it was never, uh, the magazine never got off the ground. So the article was never published. We did a show about this and uh, she walk, she basically hangs around with Noguchi for a month as he designs first a kind of a biomorphic ashtray and then a hyper industrial version that's dismountable so that it's very easy to clean. And then of course, Akari Lanterns, um, which I believe in, in total is Noguchi's most important artwork. It's social sculpture 20 years before boys. Um, it's also Noguchi's only design work that's never gone out of production. We still license the same family factory in Gifu City, Japan to make these lanterns. Um, and there are more than 200 uh, models and it's an infinite number of combinations of shade and base. Noguchi really meant it to be like a, um, a sort of, um, uh, biological universe, like have the diversity of the rainforest, Amazonian rainforest. So at the very end of his life, uh, when it came, he represented the United States at the Venice Biennale in 1986, two years before he died. The centerpiece of the presentation in the American Pavilion was this 10 foot tall, 80,000 pound marble slide. Um, in order to get publicity photos at the beginning of the show, they had to pay European tourists to slide down it because no one believed that they would be able to use the artwork. Um, you know, it just was sort of unheard of. Noguchi designed almost the entire show around Akari Lanterns, which was reportedly responsible for him not getting the Golden Lion Award, um, which they had intended to give him, but he had been told not to do Akari. And so, of course, Noguchi being Noguchi, he went off and designed 13 VB lamps, designated <laughs> Venice Biennale lamps, and uh, out of 40 things in the show, 35 of them were Akari lanterns. Um, but one of the other five things, uh, so one was a slide and then this strut system that you see on the left, which was a development of a, another structural notion of Bucky Fuller's and became the basis of a memorial that Noguchi made um, to the Challenger disaster in Miami. And then just finally, recently I've taken when people ask me, as they always do, what's your favorite sculpture, which of course is impossible to answer. Um, but I've, I've started just saying the Katsura tree um, that's in our garden. When Noguchi planted this uh, in the garden in, in around 1982 or 1983, um, it was shorter than he was. And Noguchi was you know, 90 pounds dripping wet, five foot one. Um, so it was just a teeny little sapling because this whole garden and museum he developed with his own money. And when he started, he was by no means wealthy. Um, so he, he bought the trees he could afford and it was a quarter inch sapling, teeny little thing. And this is how it looks today. So now it dominates our garden and is an you know, absolutely extraordinary space shaper. Um, he never saw it taller than maybe six feet tall. Um, wow but it's a good example of the way that Noguchi thought about sculpture, um, the way our garden has developed and will continue to develop. And actually during COVID, we lost, you can barely see it, but just down under the canopy of the tree to the right, there's a beautiful weeping cherry tree, which was original. During COVID, it was attacked by boring beetles and no one noticed. And so, and it died, it was killed. So we've had to replace it. 
um, which in some ways is, has been a net positive, I think, because it's just demonstrated and reminded us all that we're taking care of a living sculpture and that it, it's going to change over time and that we can replace the parts um, and it will, will live on. It's just going to keep developing and evolving as, as nature does. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Dakin. Um, there was that last element that you said about evolving. Um, I think that that's something that when I think about you know, functionality or interactions with, it's something that keeps on adapting and changing. Um, and another point that, um, I mean, it, it's, it's even, I wouldn't say humorous, but it's even kind of ludicrous or difficult to imagine that you'd have to pay someone um, right, to make sure that you could use something, you could, can interact, it. it's this permittance, right, you're allowed to, and I think this um, leads very interestingly, um, or quite, uh, you know, conveniently over to the first question that I had in mind for you all, which is, you know, what does functionality mean for you, what does it mean to you, and I think that um, I'd love for you to ping pong between each other, but I'm going to first send this over to um, Adeline. <laughs> Well, for the sake of just knowing what the actual definition is, I thought it would be interesting to see that functionality is the quality of being suited to serve a purpose well. And I think that's interesting because it just proves that it, it's, it's not saying functionality is design. It's not saying that at all. It's just saying that it's uh, serving a purpose well, ser fulfilling a function. So you'd have, you'd have two, two different things. You'd have the one being the physical, physical function of, of something, which Luke in his essay used as um, sort of like the use value of an object, something that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you'd have something that you can use, function, that can function in, in a more artistic uh, context, which would then uh, lead us to think more about the social function, the conceptual function. So in this, in this piece, this was the piece that really triggered me to think about all of this because um, it's the first piece I ever made with a gallery called Massa Galleria and they thrive to blur the boundaries between all these disciplines. They, uh, they work with artists, designers, architects, and they challenged me with making a piece that had some sort of function. And at first, uh, after living 14 years in London and being quite rigid with my thinking as well, you know, thinking, oh, surely I'm an artist, I can't make something functional. And I started opening up my, my vision on this topic because well, reading about it, having discussions with friends, I just realized that art doesn't necessarily mean, mean that it doesn't have any function. It's just how the intention of the artist is set. So I'm making here a piece that's uh, works as a sculpture in its own right uh, without any interaction but of course the interaction is uh, intended and encouraged so people can sit in the middle sit on top of it lounge on it touch it and I have found great pleasure in seeing that interaction and observing it and then I sort of realized well all these artists before me have have done it Noguchi being one of them Ernesto Neto um, now in terms of uh, social function, where of course, uh, Dakin, you mentioned Boyce, he was also one of them to, to use uh, function as a social tool. So, you know, we would never say that Boyce was a gardener just because he planted thousands of trees. That it's not because I'm making a piece that has a function that makes me a designer, yet I find the discussion around the, the blurring of the boundaries between one and the other really interesting. That's where I'm at. I'm really curious to hear more about what you all think. <laughs> I actually, um, I had a similar thought about this. We were looking at kind of functionality in terms of how does something perform, but also what are the side effects of it? And looking more into, you know, the actual production of our piece. And it kind of ties into our ethos where we look a lot of components being modular. How can we repurpose and reconfigure those pieces? So like here, Eden, these are actually reclaimed timber modular pieces. So we moved it in the next image to the new location, it's just simply reconfigured. Um, and I think a lot of functionality is about that. It's like, if you think about, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So like when medicine has a side effect, like how does it hit your body or, or what kind of side effects does it have? Similarly, like how do we think about the life cycle of our goods? 
how it affects the social environment, how it affects the people that are using it, that to me is functionality. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, like what, it, like the, that, that idea of like like side effects or like wider impact, right? And I, um, picking up on what you know had been said also about the social angle, um, I was wondering whether you know, Hannah, we could loop back to you and you know thinking once again about what you have been thinking about, you know, from a from a curatorial perspective, but also um, you know running you know, whether it would be on the one hand, you know, on previously like residencies, but also now the, a gallery. Um. Using the example that I brought here to illustrate the case of um, the exhibition of Jai de Lisbelle, when I was reading the, the sentence like functionality of contemporary art, maybe I was waiting more in this aspect of contemporary art. So thinking about, for example, functionality as function, when we think about something that is dysfunctional or what mm. would be the role of like contemporary art in this case to be functional, to be really like, as Adeline said, for something that is like doing well what, what the purpose was at first place. And then what we, it kind of expanded because obviously my design and architecture background kind of like tends to, to always put me on, on a position that I'm trying to make you almost like a, a, a chess mat and, and I'm trying to put like the, the exact proportions and things of like of this equilibrium. But I'm bringing more like to, to the sense that maybe like regarding contemporary art, we are also talking about um, what is the purpose of or the functionality or the duties of contemporary art today. Mm. And this is like how I brought like this illustration of Jada Isbell, which is it could be Jai as well, it could be other silenced stories or hidden stories of kind of like this rewriting, revisiting uh, narratives of maybe bringing to the spectrum things that we, haven't, that we haven't discussed, maybe bringing more of this diversity of like of cosmos, of thinking, of roads into, the, into society. This would be pretty much of like how I'm trying to delineate this idea of like functionality to more of the, the social responsibility when we, we can put in the, into the spectrum something that is much more um, about cohabiting different things at the same time rather than like um, prioritizing things like having this hegemonic um, ways of thinking rather than others. So this is how I'm like trying to link and hook the Jaiders exhibition with what I believe it's like this functionality today. That's amazing. Um, I mean, I it's, it's interesting because not to not to not to go on about myself, but when I think about um, art and curation and contemporary art, I one thing that I think is that it's one of the most empathetic yet critical mediums by which you can communicate about topics, right? So then maybe it's this idea of like, what are you saying? How are you saying it? What are you sharing? What are you then um, not only thinking, but also feeling? Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's, that, that's really, really important um, as, a form of, as a form of engagement, right? It's not just something that you, um, that you, that you look, look at, it's not passive, it's active. Um, but maybe Dakin, it'd be interesting to hear from you. Like, what does, what does that term functionality resonate or trigger with you or is it you know really what we were saying beforehand whatever well i think um noguchi thought that all art should be functional um and you know he he really saw a some kind of function uh, in the definition that adeline read um as a save a salvation for art because by the middle of this last century art had become so alienated from any kind of reality or social um, connection. Um, you know, sort of, uh, as I always say, discrete and autonomous aesthetic bonbons. That, that's what Noguchi didn't want to do. He was tired of that. He walked away from that uh, after being quite successful at it because he wanted to find a real social purpose for art. And for him, that meant going back as he often did into the past and to see examples um, of, of places where sculpture had a meaningful role to play in society. Um, and he said that uh, art can be a vital force in our everyday lives if it's pushed into communal usefulness, which is a lovely idea. Um, and he spent the rest of his career trying to do that. And that's why he made playground equipment. And that's why he continued to work in, in the theater um, 
and, and look for basically any opportunity that he could find to shape an environment in a way to help people. What, really what he believed was that we had grown and forced ourselves to be totally out of scale with nature, with our planet, and with our proper place in the universe, understanding our proper place in the universe. And he was interested in making things that would help to rescale that relationship. Um, and, and that's really what both his space, you know, all of his objects want to be spaces and all of his spaces want to be objects. But working from both sides of that spectrum, that's what he was trying to do is to give people an experience of connection um, that would help them uh, to reorient their perspective. And, uh, you know, he despised the idea, for example, of style. He didn't think mm -hmm. about style. He didn't have a style. He was totally disinterested in that. What he had was a point of view um, and, and a perspective. And he was constantly looking for ways to express it um, environmentally, essentially. And that is functional. That is incredibly functional. Like he looked, he looked to, to uh, religious uh, history, religious monuments, um, and, and uh, kind of complete societies, um, uh, civic built societies. You know, Teotihuacan and it being a great example of a model that he looked to in, in thinking about how to be you know, sort of relevant with play, play uh, mountain here. Um, and then how to turn it into something that was useful in contemporary society. Um, you know, he, he talked about the true development of old traditions. And by old traditions, he meant really uh, all of the, what we now think of as the design fields, um, the many design fields. He was very fortunate. I think Hannah said something totally lovely and wonderful, um, but, but uh, sort of biculturality or multiculturality, what it gives you is the ability to get outside of those stupid um, hierarchies and yeah. hegemonies uh, because they're different everywhere. And as soon as you realize that, you realize that they are not um, the be all and end all. And so Noguchi combined them kind of every which way um, in search of social impact. It's really amazing. And there's so many points that resonated. And if I, if, if I may, there's two, two points um, that I want to touch on. One was this idea of um, communal usefulness. And now that you say that out loud, actually that runs deeply into why Benny and I built and have been building Aura, um, because it, it, it came from you know this origin of looking into why art would be in hospitals and realizing that there was this neuro aesthetic uh, quality to not only art but also design architecture all these different creative practices and then thinking how can we bring these to people around the world right and then our answer seemed to be at the time virtual reality and then going off and creating this environment that um, actually precisely that tries to resist um, you know, definition um, of one thing rather than another, but does have the goal um, of communal usefulness, whether it be as a point of discovery or of inspiration, or to use another term that, um, that, 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 that you used, um, community, right? It really, really like sharing and, um, you know, coming, coming, coming together. Um, and I was wondering whether maybe this idea of this functionality or even contemporary art and so on and so forth, whether, you know, I mean, we've obviously been through uh, a really, really big year um, and whether this, you know, this thought process, maybe it's, has, it, has, this, has this notion developed for you at all over time in the context of perhaps your practices or your um, different projects? Maybe perhaps I'm looking, once again, Adeline, maybe I can ping it back to you whether it's something that's developed over time, because you mentioned, for example, that Massa Galleria, you know, they urged you to think about, you know, these, these limitless possibilities first. Yes, I think so. I think, uh, I think it's got to do something with the fact that I, I moved to Mexico and somehow moving to another country enables, you know, a certain freedom to, 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 set, to settle in and to a will to experiment. I mean, looking at this piece now, this piece I, I, I made when I was still living in London, somehow it's, it already had uh, suggested a function. I, I was inviting the audience to lie on the, on the bed and, and look at the moons. So 
so that like witness the time passing by as the lights go on and off one after the other um, so I think I think of course context definitely plays an impact on how one thinks more about that or, or, or not so I think having moved to Mexico having started a, a relationship with Massa Galleria and, and observed how other artists uh, and, and designers, architects work here and are, aren't burdened by these categories. Mm -hmm. having, having read Listening to Stone, uh, the, by Noguchi's biography, also helped a lot with letting go of all these uh, you know, fears around being categorized and pigeonholed and judged. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, abs abs absolutely. I think the context definitely plays a role on, on how one ends up perceiving this. You had, uh, had you invited me to a talk like this, you know, six years ago, I would have been a bit reticent, not knowing how, quite how I would have fit in. And now I'm actually feeling so comfortable about the subject. And I, I if anything, I was the instigator. I, wa I wanted yeah. to discuss it. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's, uh, that, that's how an artist should make without any fear of, of being judged or categorized. Uh, if, if anything, Noguchi was one to say that we, we have, as artists, we, we should never let go of the child within us. We should always keep playing. And I think, ask children they, they won't know about categories they won't know what they're doing they'll just play and they're to me the best artists <laughs> so so yeah context definitely has an impact yeah context I, I what you were saying also about burden um and I, I think actually I was also saying that Dakin was beforehand saying it was about structures and uh you know, we as humans, we are the ones who create structures, whether it be, you know, language, whether it be, you know, you do it this way or that way, but actually then we also have the capacity to, to break them down. So I think it's first of all, recognizing them. And then as a result, just going past them. And I think one way of doing that also is, you know, these fictitious, you know, geographic uh, restraints uh, that have been set in order to categorize I'm from here or you're from there, right? And then once you have this place, uh, space of multiplicity, then it's, broad. Um, thinking just before we wrap up this question, I, I was I was thinking about, you know, Sophia and Lisa about, you know, your installation that you did, you know, here in London, and how to a certain extent, you know, it's, there is, it, it's shifted, it keeps on shifting and turning and moving and also thinking what Dakin was saying about, you know, the sculpture with that, which then keeps on evolving. Um, right. So if you think about evolution and sculptures or spaces evolving, I mean, this is exactly what you've been doing and creating maybe to a certain extent. Yeah, actually, I did. I had to think about the two when Dakin was talking about the Noguchi sculpture that got eaten because um, our Eden is, as you can see, it's an um, micro ecosystem of plants and vegetation. And one thing I actually forgot to mention earlier, which is the biggest thing about it, is that it was interactive. So people could come and plant their own, their own seeds or take seeds with them. So it keeps changing. It was changing throughout like all of autumn, winter, because some of the plants suddenly started blooming in winter. God knows why. Oh, it was a warm winter. <laughs> but especially seeing the evolution of it as people actively participated in the installation and they came there, they were so happy planting seeds and see, you know, how it's growing. And every time you go there, it looks different just a little bit because it's nature and it just does what it does with a little bit of help from us. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very, ever since we do lots of like projects like that more and more, um, Although we come from an architecture background, so it's all about, like you say, the structure, but we started breaking the structure down in smaller scale. That was our first approach. And then uh, blurring, the blur sorry, blurring the boundaries between, you know, going more into landscape art or landscape design and merging this with product. And then it's like, when, you know, when Adeline said earlier, so is this culture is functional is it then design no it's not or is our design art like which <laughs> what is it or are we the other way around but nice to have it i'd, I'd just like to follow up on that because i remember architecture school so i we've you know seems like most of us got have got an architecture background <laughs> we were posed the question when is art architecture 
and when is architecture art and actually the the summary of it all came down to when art becomes functional it becomes architecture and we're kind of like blowing that out of the water now because we're all saying that it can function in different ways and there's something really beautiful that Dakin was saying uh, a quote from Noguchi about art can be whatever people make it or whatever moves people and I think interestingly I was looking back at the word functionality which comes from function which comes from the Latin, which was about performance or the execution of a task. But then in certain languages, like in French, for example, it was about one's own work or one's own purpose. So, I mean, I'm just interested to maybe pose the question, how does art function for different people? You know, how does it fo function in a physical way, in an emotional way? Um, maybe Henna, you can touch up on that. I, I know you were talking about it through some of your artists. Yes, absolutely. Um, this, uh, we always had this discussion about like what is art and what is design. Huh? Like for me, I'm not so much interested about that because I think we are beyond this discussion. Like I don't want to put us in a place that where you have to be in the position of judge of judging things if this is it or this is not. I like to think something that is like wider than that. Um, so uh, like what I try to bring here, like with, the, with this example of Jaida, but also like as a, from a curatorial perspective, like how this functionality have changed is when you think about um, the purpose of art, because likewise in, in French in Portuguese, function also has some sort of like connection with role and purpose. So it goes more about this responsibility strand that I, I try to, um, to hook. I think this is, has to be, has to do a lot of uh, about this imagining like futures or reimagining or rethinking ways of doing, doing or, or um, one time, let, let me <laughs> be bored here. No. There are two things that are coming to my mind. One is like Lakaton Vassal winning Pritzker uh, yesterday or the day after, the day before, right? Nina Bobardi also winning the, the Leone de Oro in Venice Biennial. Both of these um, um, prizes, I think, somehow show us about what is happening currently about in architecture, but it also goes to other spheres, which is very much about this collective vision, this collectivity. And when you have the wider spectrum of like how you approach to things, and I think this happens the same with contemporary art. When it goes less to your, to our, anthropomorphic or anthropocentric thing, which is much less based on one individual and goes to a wider sense of this community or this collectivity. And I think this, like, this two examples, Lacaton and Lina Bubaji brings a lot about that and kind of reflects on other fields as well. Mm. Actually, I, it's interesting you bring up uh, Lacaton Vassal because they're, they're a practice that I look to very much in terms of their spirit and their ambitions and they say something really beautiful which is not to do with art but it's to do with physical and material things and they say that luxury isn't about the price or the quality of the material it's about the generosity in space and what they do with that and what they create so yeah I, I totally believe that and I think that also you know lends itself really nicely to what we're talking about in terms of what art can do and how generous that can be and Dakin also mentioned something about, you know, the experience that people might search through art that gives them a connection to something. Um, we're coming towards the end of the talk, and I think we should open up the questions to, the, uh, to, the, to our guests. So we've got one from Bernardo, and it says, what do you think about functionality in digital art? I wonder if we could maybe, um, Adeline, seeing as you know, from, from a sculpt sculptural artistic perspective, how do you think that you'd answer that? I wish I had a pertinent uh, reply for this one because I, f I feel quite re removed from digital art given the fact that I love being connected with materials. That's why I asked However, you. yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> However, I do think technology, of course, plays a very important role in how things are changing and how, uh, how making is evolving uh, more and more, especially I think during quarantine now that we've had uh, restrictions and we've, we've had to keep making in new conditions. 
I've had more of my friends, including myself, including, including my husband, who have been trying to, to keep making within the circumstances of, of today with the, with, the, with the pandemic. And we've, we've turned to, to 3D renders uh, a lot more because with the lack of accessibility to our studios, we've had to keep, keep ideas evolving, keep making. And, and 3D drawing has been a huge tool. So it's a technology is, is of course playing a very important role. And, um, and I think function is very relevant in, in, in process in general, uh, in process of making. I stumbled upon an interview with uh, Fili de Barlow on Art 21. I think it was only two days ago or something like that. And she said something, I wrote, I wrote it down because I thought it was very interesting. She said, talking about her, her relationship with her assistants, she said, the way I inform them of certain aesthetic qualities that I want is keeping their actions to something that is more functional than artistic, like, cleaning, like a cleaning gesture with a brush that happens to be loaded with paint. So it just got me thinking about how functionality doesn't necessarily have to be a means to an end, uh, a purpose for a piece of, you know, when the piece is, fine, is, is resolved and finished and, and, and already interacting with the world, but also part of the process. And this is one example where the process is clearly really hands-on, but in the digital art, I think that's the, the process is very much, uh, well, the, the maker with the machine and that's where it becomes, it's, it becomes a practical tool. And that's, that's yet another way of looking at functionality, looking at it as a tool. For sure. Does anyone want to sort of expand on that? We've got quite a few. I want to expand a little bit more on the digital idea or the digital art too, the virtual um, art of reality, because I had this conversation with Jai Derna, like a few days ago, and he was explaining to me about this because he called, for example, um, there is the fruit where he extracts the ink, where he paints the canvases, and this is called Jenny you know? Papo. And then he called it like a technological fruit because it transmits through like a vehicle, you transmit knowledge, you transmit um, uh, information, etc. And he was explaining to me that, well, actually, we ind indigenous people, we have access to the virtual world since, you know, like ancient times. And like, and I asked him like, what do you mean about that? And he said like, well, through the dreams, through dreams, like wh why are you dreaming? Or why are you taking like um, ayahuasca or ac accessing through others ways? you're always communicating with a parallel virtual world or reality where you can reimagine things, predict things or change things. So for me, like this functionality in the virtual reality be either like us creating, for example, either you creating aura, which is also imagining something that we, it doesn't exist in the reality, but we are also trying to think about possible ways of doing things to indigenous communities also like communicating through this virtual, through the dreams to, to change or like predict or, or access certain informations. And I think this also has to have to do with, with this functionality that we are trying to say here. That's great. Do you solve problems in your dreams? Sorry, cheeky side question. Because <laughs> lots of people solve problems in their sleep, right? When I can't figure something out, I have to sleep over it. That's where the term comes from. And you, you go and it's resolved the next day, hopefully. <laughs> Usually I work things out in the shower. So great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, we've got a question from Lottie, which is, um, there's a question about scale and how this affects the idea of function. I.e., where does it live? What, function, what does, it, does it interact with? Um, Dakin, I wonder if you can expand on that you talked a lot about you know um items that d didn't really matter what the scale was they always served a function um well Noguchi thought a lot about scale because he was so often involved with architects and so resented the sort of traditional uh, mindset that architects brought to their interaction with sculptors which was usually i left a spot here i want something that fits do you have something that i can make the size that i want it thinking that that would turn it into an appropriately scaled thing. 
Um, and that's just not the way that he thought about things. Um, his goal was to make, you know, the, we are important. We are an important reference point for ourselves. So Noguchi ultimately disciplined everything to human scale because that is the most effective way to impact human consciousness. Um, so everything is, is roughly speaking in human scale with him. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, he thought in terms of disciplining his activities um, through that kind of mechanism. He really was, he thought like an engineer, um, you know, that's how we function and that's how he accomplished um, um, something that um, we just heard about, you know, how do you from, I feel it a brother, is that who it was who was saying, you know, you use this kind of technique rather than that kind of technique, which is a way to escape a particular kind of expectation. Noguchi did that all the time with sculpture um, by you, importing um, techniques from other disciplines, very often engineering, um, you know, and, and the funny thing is he used, he talked about imaginary landscapes, which is an idea that he adapted from John Cage. Um, and uh, he was very interested in mindscaping. That was the way that he worked out his topographies. Um, and that really for him came out of the theater. Um, theater set design was his version of CAD modeling. Cause of course there were no computers. Um, he's one of those people who had amazing three dimensional awareness. You know, he could create an object in his mind and spin it around and understand uh, how it would work from all, all perspectives. But the way that he road tested that was uh, rather than CAD or Rhino or whatever is he would do it in, in the theater. Um, and the way that he did it quickly, because of course quick is important when you're doing that kind of quick thinking and, and three dimensional thinking, um, the carving that he did for Martha Graham, he did in balsa wood because he could carry a huge pile of balsa wood lumber to the theater over his shoulder and it carves like butter. So he could carve it very, very quickly and easily. And it was a way to model up ideas into full dimensionality in space and interact with them. It's just all, it's like everything is, everything that's old is new again. Everything that's new is old again. Um, I always, with Noguchi, it's always whip stitching is the way I think of it. You know, sewing the past into the future. Um, and that was, he, he never met technology that he didn't like. He was always interested in trying to adapt to the next generation of ways of doing things. Um, but always with uh, sort of disciplining them through purpose. You know, they're not worthwhile in and of themselves. Mm. I think that's equally true of these digital tools that we have now. For sure, for sure. Um, we're, we're sort of coming up to the end of the talk, but uh, Adeline, I wondered whether your friend wanted to make any comments. You mentioned when we were sort Luke of catching Luke Hart, he's, he's, he's here. Yeah. Does he uh, if, if there's anything you wanted to add, Luke, please feel free. He's written a brilliant uh, paper on the subject, which I, I read I, and, and thought it was brilliant. So if there's anything he'd like to share. I, I, I think I've unmuted myself. Am I being heard by people? Yes. Yeah. Okay, hi, thank you very much. This has been very insightful and enjoyable. Um, I just wanted to say sort of along the same lines when you were talking about the digital aspect of things, I always found really interesting the link, and I wrote a comment in the chat about this, between early analytical cubism and what eventually became the technology of sort of photographic 3D digital scanning. And it always seemed to me like what Picasso and Brock were doing in those early days were kind of inventing the concept of 3D visual scanning, but the technology just took 90 years to catch up with them. So even like when I was when I was in graduate school, I got in touch with people from the design engineering department and I was studying sculpture, but I was writing this paper and they were trying to develop a 3D a software and hardware for a camera that you could move in three dimensions around an object and get a photographic, but also accurate 3D scan of the thing. And the early images from the tech that they were trying to develop just looked like cubist paintings, which I just found incredibly enjoyable. And it's sort of like what Dakin was saying that these things always, you know, it's always the same thing going on and the ways that people, and I love your description of how Noguchi could make, 
have a 3D object in his mind and move it around and manipulate it and then get it out. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks for letting me contribute. No worries. Thanks, Luke. Actually, what you just said reminds me of uh, something that I just happened to watch last night before dinner, um, a, a documentary with Anish Kapoor. And he talks about how a lot of his later work was inspired by one drawing that he'd done, I think even at school, which was test making a computer go from a circle to a square. And it sort of creates this really, really beautiful image. It's a very, very simple sketch. And you know, just what you're saying there, there's sort of this real clear circular quality to all of this. Um, Jen, you want to say something? No, I was gonna say that, um... Yeah, I have so many different thoughts, especially when it comes to process and using different different technologies and like pushing that and how it can, you know, technology can be a really, really core part of that. But then I'm thinking about all further types of what the technology displaying, you know, different or different, different art or architecture, what function does that play in terms of like accessibility, diversity, but then we're going into a whole other rabbit hole, which we probably don't have time for right now, um, seeing uh, as a Swiss timekeeper, We've run um, five minutes, five minutes over. Um, but I really want to thank, uh, and I, you know, I think Benny and I, we just really want to thank all of you this evening um, for sharing uh, your different practices, your backgrounds, your passions, your thoughts. Um, yes, and Bernardo, topic for the next talk. I like it. <laughs> um, your thoughts, um, your your different experiences, and your different impressions. You know, I think this has been a really fruitful and definitely thought provoking exchange. We were chatting about you know where you process ideas. I do that on walks, so I probably have to take a long walk now. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you've enjoyed this evening, you know, please stay tuned. Please. Um, follow us um, on Instagram or join our newsletter. Um, next week, we'll be having a, a food and art exchange. Um, so thinking about activation of the senses and how that can be done, not only through taste, um, but also through visual means between food designer Imogen Kwok and um, artist Jane Buston. Um, and you know, we really, really look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Um, and, you know, once again, thank you so much to Adeline, Lisa, Sophia, Hannah, Dakin. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without you. Thanks for everyone for joining. Bye. 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 Good night.